per cominciare è tenuta dal professor Richard, Richard Evans, professore di storia moderna all'Università di Cambridge e oggi uno dei più grandi storici di storia della Germania contemporanea. Autore di una trilogia, il cui ultimo volume è uscito in Italia in queste settimane dal titolo Il Terzo Reich al Potere 1933-1939 ed edito da Mondadori. E di un libro che in un qualche modo si può considerare di metodologia della storia, intitolato In difesa della storia, almeno questo è il titolo italiano, pubblicato da Sellerio in Italia nel 2001. Il tema di questa conferenza è in un qualche modo la guerra combattuta come risultato di un immaginario della guerra già fatta in precedenza, cioè quello che rimane della memoria di un evento e di come questo determina azioni successive. La guerra ricordata non è mai solamente qualcosa che ti è accaduto, è anche il rancore, la nostalgia, il senso dei sentimenti, la proiezione che ti dà di interpretazioni di fatti e di eventi che hai subito e che in parte hanno segnato il tuo presente su cui cerchi un riscatto. Ecco, questo è più o meno il tema di lavoro della conferenza del professor Ivans, che io chiedo a lui di prendere la parola. Grazie. On the night of the 30th of January, 1933, a few hours after Adolf Hitler had been appointed head of a new German government, torch-lit processions of Nazi stormtroopers and veterans from the Steel Helmets movement paraded through the streets of Berlin, marching through the same streets and squares in which enthusiastic crowds had gathered in August 1914 to greet the outbreak of the First World War. Is that better? Okay. So this is a picture of the torch-lit parades in uh, 1933, when Hitler's appointed chancellor, uh, marching through the same streets uh, where crowds had gathered in August 1914 to greet the outbreak of the First World War. Hermann Goering, the Nazi Minister of the Interior for Prussia, announced that the mood can only be compared with that of 1914, when a nation also rose up to defend everything it possessed. The spirit of the August 1914 days declared the Nazi daily paper on the 5th of August 1934 has found its fulfillment. We have reconquered the spirit of 1914 as the foundation of our future as the beginning of our new will. And this image of the Nazi seizure of power as a repeat of the experience of 1914 was shared in full measure by the Nazi party leader, Adolf Hitler, seen here in a photograph of the crowd that greeted the outbreak of the Great War in Munich in August 1914. In his book, Mein Kampf, My Struggle, dictated in prison in the mid-1920s, part memoir, part political tract, Hitler wrote that the declaration of war had seemed to him, I quote, like a release from the painful feelings of my youth. A fight for freedom had begun, mightier than the earth had ever seen. For once destiny had begun its course, the conviction dawned on even the broad masses this time, Germany was fighting for her existence, the German nation for life or death, freedom and future. In 1934, the Nazi Labour Front leader, Robert Ley, declared the German Revolution began in those August days of 1914. And as the historian Tim Mason who did more than anyone else to focus attention on the importance of the memory of the First World War for National Socialism and the Nazi dictatorship concluded, the policy of Nazism, he wrote, can be viewed in part as an attempt to fix in the political consciousness the chimera 
of a society held together by ideological bonds alone. So the Third Reich's aim, fundamental aim, was to recreate the spirit of 1914, as it understood it, on a permanent basis. For the Nazis, as Hitler's statement in Mein Kampf suggested, Germans came together in 1914 not in an act of international aggression, but in a struggle for self-preservation. Germany, in this view, had been encircled by her enemies, who were now falling upon her with unprecedented fury. So Germany was fighting for her existence. The belief that Germany was surrounded by a world of enemies, all engaged in trying to destroy the German race, became more common during the First World War, here illustrated in a contemporary picture by Kalbach, and helped fuel the belief that the spirit of 1914 had been undermined by revolutionaries on the home front, acting in concert with Germany's enemies abroad, or, as here in this contemporary cartoon, Social Democrats, Scheidemann, Catholic Center parties, Erzberger behind him, both signatories of the Treaty of Versailles, steered from behind by a Jewish conspiracy to stab the soldiers in the back. It's not lack of resources or military prowess in this view that caused the German defeat. It was lack of will. The German armed forces, like Siegfried in the legend, made popular and Richard Wagner's music drama, Goethe Dämmerung, Twilight of the Gods, had been stabbed in the back. And the desire to avoid this being repeated was a central element in Nazi ideology from the very beginning. Nazism's historical memory was thus predicated on the perceived need to recreate the spirit of 1914 and prevent the recurrence of 1918, both seen through the ideological lens of National Socialism. It also encompassed the belief that the war itself had shown the way to the remaking of Germans through the creation of a new type of human being. August 1914 had, in this view, brought Germans together in the desire to create a national community. But it was actually the experience of the war that really created it. As Robert Lai said, it was in the trenches of East and West that the nation discovered itself. The grenades and mines never bothered to ask if you were well born, rich or poor, what your religion was or what class you belonged to. Rather, it was a monumental test of the meaning and spirit of this community. And in 1939 to 40, that test, finally in this view, was passed. And in July 1940, indeed, celebrating the victory over France that the Kaiser's Germany had failed to obtain, Hitler declared, at this time, the renewed spirit of 1914 had not simply passed away, but had achieved a lasting importance. And one reason for this, was that, as this 1940 speech of Hitler suggested, the Nazis devoted ceaseless efforts since 1933 to recreate the iron-willed, earnest, fanatical soldier spirit of the First World War in the great mass of Germans, or to be more precise, German men. The Nazis believed that the world Jewish conspiracy, as they saw it against Germany, had undermined the Germans' fighting spirit, not only in 1918, but also subsequently during the Weimar Republic in the 1920s and early 30s. Artists like Otto Dix had portrayed the experience of war in terms of suffering and death instead of heroism and glory. And memorials to the dead of the First World War, like the Magdeburg altar of Ernst Barlach, had, in the Nazi view, demeaned them by foregrounding mourning and despair instead of courage and optimism. 
Erich Maria Remarque's novel All Quiet on the Western Front, published in 1929 and filmed the following year, was enormously popular. But the Nazis regarded it as a pacifist tract. They claimed the author's real name was the Jewish Kramer, spelt backwards, complete invention, and consigned the book to the flames in the notorious book burnings that took place in German university towns on the 10th of May, 1933, with the proclamation that it was being consigned to the flames in an act carried out, as they said, against literary betrayal of the soldiers of the World War for the education of the nation in a spirit of military preparedness. Almost as soon as the Nazis came to power, they arrested and imprisoned prominent pacifist journalists and activists of the Weimar years, most notably Karl von Ossietzky, who was later awarded the Nobel Peace Prize while in a Nazi prison. They forced others like Remarque into exile. Barlach's memorial was removed from Magdeburg Cathedral and other artworks critical of the martial spirit were taken down from the walls of German galleries and museums and in 1937 exhibited in the notorious degenerate art exhibition in Munich. A special section, one of nine, into which the exhibition was divided, was devoted to paintings showing soldiers as war cripples or murderers. The catalogue complained that in such depictions, quote, the deeply ingrained respect for every soldierly virtue, for courage, bravery, and readiness for action is to be driven out of the people's consciousness. For the Nazis, pacifism, indeed any kind of criticism of war and the experience of war, was a weapon used against Germany by the world of enemies that surrounded her, orchestrated by the Jew. And what the Nazis wanted to substitute for critical representations of the war were works of art and literature that portrayed combat in an unambiguously positive light. The classic work of literature here was Storm of Steel by Ernst Junger, who in the 1920s at least was a good deal closer to the Nazis than he later cared to admit. Junger's book, not surprisingly, was singled out by Nazi propagandists like Josef Goebbels as a classic of literature, conveying with admirable intensity the excitement of war, the élan of the troops who'd fought for Germany. And bestsellers with fewer literary pretensions or merits frequently achieved their success through the glorification of war in the Nazi years, including, for example, the now forgotten Paul Etikhofer's Verdun, The Supreme Judgment, 1936, which had sold 300,000 copies and more by 1940. At the same time as the Degenerate Art Show was put on, there's also the Great German Art Exhibition, which is meant to demonstrate by contrast what truly German art should be like. And there were scenes here of soldierly heroism alongside the tasteful pseudo-classical nudes and scenes of bucolic contentment that Hitler so prized. The real hour of military art came with the outbreak of the Second World War. In 1940, the exhibition was revamped to include more war pictures, such as this one by Herbert Schnurpel. Artists were commissioned to accompany the troops. And by 1944, there were over 80 artists, war artists, embedded, as we now say, in troop units in the German armed forces. They were, of course, chosen for their admiration of combat and their endorsement of military values. They painted only positive, optimistic scenes and depictions of heroic martial deeds. The most popular of them, the war artist Elk Eber, whose picture, The Messenger, was endlessly reproduced during the war, painted as his obituary noted in 1941, only one theme, the soldierly, soldierly heroic masculinity of our time. 
All these 80 German war artists, between them, did not depict a single death of a German soldier, not even wounds or blood, let alone corpses. And the contrast with the grim depictions of war by artists like Otto Dix could not have been more striking. The Nazi glorification of war extended far beyond its expression in the arts. It permeated almost every aspect of education and socialization in the Third Reich. School history textbooks were rewritten. The curriculum was reshaped to teach pupils as the Nazi teachers' organizations periodical declared in, already in August 1933 to value military courage and model themselves on heroic German soldiers of the past. School children of all ages had to parade and drill in school hours. Teachers were required to attend military training sessions in camps. Schoolboys were forced to join the Hitler Youth and undergo yet further bouts of square bashing and military instructions. You had to raise the Nazi flag at the beginning of every school day. As historian Richard Bessel has noted, the ideology of Nazism was an ideology of war, which regarded peace merely as a preparation for war. The language of war was rarely absent from the propaganda of the Nazi movement and the Nazi regime. The Nazi leadership, he says, sought to militarize the German economy and society and to indoctrinate the German population into the willing acceptance and even enthusiastic approval of war. And indeed, it was the aim of the Nazis to recreate in Germany and Germans the spirit of comradeship, heroism, courage, and aggression that they imagined had prevailed at the front in 1914 to 18. But at the same time, the Nazis also emphasized repeatedly the spirit of self-sacrifice for the greater good and the willingness to die for Germany. And the heroes enthroned in the Nazis' own pantheon were above all party members and stormtroopers who'd sacrificed themselves in the cause. The men whose blood stained the so-called blood flag carried in the march on Munich's center in the failed Beer Hall Putsch of 1923, flag that was paraded at key Nazi ceremonies and party rallies. Heroes such as Horst Wessel, murdered by communists as he struggled, supposedly, to build a better Germany, a hero commemorated in the Nazi party anthem, the Horst Wessel song. Death holds no sting for us, Heinrich Himmler told his SS, because, as he said, individuals die while the folk, the people, lives on. And indeed, SS men commonly sang an anthem which included a passage dedicating themselves to love death. The dead were commemorated in the annual rituals of Heroes Memorial Day. So powerful is this cult of death that the most committed Nazi soldiers internalized it, turning the Waffen-SS, the military divisions of the SS, into a military force whose casualty rate was far above that of the ordinary frontline army. Writing to his mother in 1940, in his last letter, a former Hitler Youth leader told her she was not to feel sad when she received the news that he'd been killed at the front. If I die, mother, he wrote, you must bear it, and your pride will conquer your pain, because you have the privilege of offering a sacrifice. That is what we mean when we say Germany. And death is presented, as in the art uh, of the time, not in terms of suffering, but in sanitized images and language, a glorious passing that would lead to celebration and not mourning. The place of death in the Nazi vision of war loomed ever larger as the vast conflict of the Second World War began to turn against Germany. And a first high point was reached during the Battle of Stalingrad, when the German Sixth Army under General von Paulus was surrounded and annihilated 
by Red Army troops. More than 200,000 were killed, 235,000 captured. Turning down the invitation to commit suicide that accompanied his promotion to field marshal, Paulus surrendered instead, along with the remnants of his starving and bedraggled army. German propaganda had given the battle particular importance because of the city's close association with the Soviet dictator Stalin. And as the end drew near, however, propaganda began instead to emphasize the heroic sacrifice of the rapidly diminishing number of German troops holed up in the Stalingrad area. They died so that Germany could live, declared the Nazis' daily newspaper on the 4th of January, 19, uh, sorry, on the, uh, on the 4th of February, 1943, just after the surrender. The battle, declared Hermann Goering on the 30th of January, 43, the 10th anniversary of Hitler's appointment as Reich Chancellor, the battle will remain the greatest heroic struggle in our history. And heroism, in other words, is increasingly becoming a synonym for self-sacrifice. Even a year earlier, the diarist Victor Klemperer had recorded a conversation with an anti-Nazi friend who'd reported to him, beaming, that things were going badly for the uh, German uh, armies in Africa. Is this really the case? asked Klemperer. The newspaper reports only speak of victories. They write, replied his friends, they're writing, our heroically fighting troops. Heroically sounds like an obituary. As Klemperer dryly noted, since then, heroically, in the bulletins, has reliably sounded many more times like an obituary. Propaganda Minister Josef Goebbels' reaction to the defeat at Stalingrad was to announce the redoubling of the German people's war efforts. Do you want total war? He asked a hand-picked audience of 14,000 people in Berlin's Sports Palace on the 18th of February, 1943. The minutes of the meeting record, of course, loud cries of yes. But the propaganda uh, minister's proclamation met with widespread skepticism amongst ordinary Germans. Civilian mobilization had already gone as far as it could. The measures Goebbels announced after the speech were more symbolic than real in economic terms. Already under the Weimar Republic, people's thoughts turned to the possibility of a future war and the growing threat of aerial bombardment. As early as 1927, a civil defense movement was established with the aim of getting people to prepare for air attacks launched by Germany's enemies who once more were supposedly conspiring to find ways of breaking German morale and undermining the German will to fight, even in the Weimar Republic. Once Hitler came to power, the state backed these efforts, advertising the threat of aerial bombardment by means of huge model bombs placed in Berlin squares. As an air raid protection exhibition noted, these gave people an idea of the degree of the vulnerability of our threatened fatherland to air attacks. So throughout the German Reich in the Nazi period, air raid precautions were established and people exhorted, as in this poster, to pay attention to the need to develop air raid protection um, measures. Air raid wardens were appointed, air raid exercises held, air raid sirens were installed. Berliners reported a newspaper after one particularly large exercise in Berlin in 1937, which involved the dropping of dummy bombs on one part of the city, people being forced to black out their windows, rush for shelter, the sirens sounded, streets cordoned off, hundreds of fake wounded lying around waiting <clears throat> for ambulances to collect them. People of Berlin have got an idea, said a paper, of what total war will mean in future. In a real war, it will no longer just be the soldier whose experiences, who experiences aerial war in a physical sense. Every national comrade is obliged to help defense as far as he can. But this too was designed mainly to strengthen people's will, their mental preparedness, uh, their desire to survive. 
By the time the war broke out, very few air raid shelters had in fact been constructed. The only 1,700 bunkers right across the land in August 1943 were completely inadequate numbers for a nation of 80 million people. As the Allied uh, strategic bombing campaign spread and intensified, Germans were forced to make do with makeshift arrangements and cellars and under kitchen tables during raids. Popular fear of aerial bombardment, which was strong even before German combat planes had destroyed the Basque town of Guernica in the Spanish Civil War, was in the end proved justified. More than half a million German civilians were killed in air raids by the end of the war, <coughs> around the same number that had died as a result of the Allied blockade in 1914 to 18. And whole cities, as here in Hamburg, were effectively devastated. Fundamentally, the Nazi regime believed that attack was the best means of defense, not least because it was a superior way in their view, of mobilizing people's will and inspiring them with a desire to fight. Taking shelter in a bunker in the end was neither noble nor heroic. Getting into a fighter plane or even manning an anti-aircraft battery was. World of enemies, the Nazis saw as threatening Germany's existence <clears throat> would not be destroyed by going underground. <clears throat> it had to be confronted and destroyed itself. Just as Nazism tried to reinvent the German as a kind of superman, so too it looks to new technology to bring victory in war. Aeroplanes would be su suitable vehicles for the dashing and heroic pilots of the future. And in fact, the German Air Force never developed a serious heavy bomber program. Rockets would harness the most advanced scientific developments in the service of Germany's uh, defense, a defense achieved by bringing the war to its enemies. And all this would reaffirm Germany's rebirth from the humiliations of the stab in the back, the diktat of Versailles, the economic miseries of Weimar, and the supposed hegemony of pacifism in the Weimar Republic. By the later stages of the war, <clears throat> these developments had been taken up in the promise of wonder weapons that would turn the tide of conflict that had been going against Germany since Stalingrad. But even implicit in the title given to two of the best known such weapons, the V1 flying bomb, seen here in action, and the V2 rocket, even the title given to them was an acknowledgement of the dimensions of the Allied success in destroying Germany's cities from the air because V stood for Vergeltung, retribution. Much of this was designed also to shore up German morale and damage the British will to fight. And here's a leaflet dropped over London, telling Londoners that the new secret weapon uh, actually exists, the V number one, roaring monsters of the air are smashing London with dreadful precision. So it's designed, in other words, to undermine Londoners' will to carry on the war. The V1 and V2, in fact, were never deployed on a large enough scale to be really effective. The technological investments of the German state were dissipated over many different projects, from a ground-to-air missile <clears throat> to an atomic bomb from nerve gases such as sarin, which was invented by the Nazis, to a jet engine fighter plane, <clears throat> from a fast air-conditioned U-boat to a huge gun christened the V3, designed to rain shells down on London. These were all developed, apart from the atomic bomb, but not in sufficient quantities. The Allies bombed the construction sites. There was not enough raw material or metal to build these devices in large numbers. There was not enough fuel to make them work. So much fuel went into the V2, which is the 
really the only one against which there was no effective defense, that it could only carry a small amount of explosive. Increasingly, the wonder weapons were used as a way of shoring up the drooping morale of the German people. And even this failed in the end. Nobody wrote an SS report on morale towards the end of the war in 1945. Nobody believes that we can still escape a catastrophe with the methods and possibilities of waging war that have existed up to now. The last spark of hope remains rescue from outside or a completely exceptional set of circumstances or a secret weapon of enormous power. And this hope too, concluded the SS, is being extinguished. Technology also came to the Nazis' aid in the central campaign of the whole war, the campaign against the Jews, who Hitler, Goebbels, and the Nazi leadership believed were orchestrating the entire world conspiracy to destroy the German race. Here is a propaganda poster uh, saying that it's the Jew who is uh, bringing on the war and extending the length of the war. On the sixth anniversary of his appointment as chancellor, on the 30th of January 1939, Hitler issued a chilling self-styled prophecy that, he said, if international finance jury launched another war, world war, it will be the Jews, not the Germans, who will be annihilated. And throughout the war, Hitler himself, Goebbels, and other Nazi leaders referred back almost obsessively to this statement above all after the invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941, by which time American support of the British war effort through the Lend-Lease Agreement of March 1941 had brought them to believe, or the Nazis to believe, that Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin were all tools of the same kind of world Jewish conspiracy that had brought Germany to her knees in 1918. And here you see it with the British, American, and Soviet flags behind the enemy powers is the Jew, uh, a, a claim so ridiculous um, that it could only really have been made in a country where extreme anti-Semites have been in power for a number of years. <coughs> On the sixth anniversary, sorry, um, so this is, uh, this is uh, in 1941, this kind of propaganda of course is only possible after the, after the uh, invasion of the Soviet Union. But from this point onwards, this claim and the uh, claim made by uh, Hitler that the Jews would be annihilated if there was another world war, and the entry of America made it a world war, all of this spurred Himmler and the SS to embark on a rapidly expanding campaign of mass murder against Europe's Jews that reached its culmination in the gas chambers of the Reinhard camps and Auschwitz in 1942. So war in the Nazi imagination was not just a war between states or peoples or nations, not just a war between armies and navies and air forces, but a war between races. Hitler's version of social Darwinism saw international relations as a struggle between races for the survival of the fittest. It was kill or be killed. It was victory or death. This belief came to the fore in the invasion of Poland in 1939. Even before the order to march was issued, Hitler was telling his generals, Genghis Khan hunted millions of women and children to their deaths consciously and with a joyous heart, and you must do the same. He had already, he said, issued the SS with a command to send man, woman, and child of Polish descent and language to their death, pitilessly and remorselessly. Poland, he said, will be depopulated and settled with Germans. And it's in this context he made a statement according to one source, who now remembers the Armenians, referring to the Armenian genocide of 1915. And the same fate was to befall the Slavs who inhabited the Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. Up to 45 million Slavs were to perish from disease and starvation, according to the so-called General Plan for the East, 
which became official government policy in 1942. And yet even this would not be the end of war, because ultimately war in the Nazi imagination was not only war without limit, it was also war without end. In his long unpublished second book, written in 1928, but only rediscovered decades later, and on subsequent occasions too, Hitler made it clear that the purpose of conquering Eastern Europe was not only to provide Germany with a source of food supplies that would enable her to avoid the kind of Allied blockade that had done such damage in 1914 to 18, but also to give Germany a land empire equivalent to that of the USA, a land empire that in the long run would provide the basis for a still greater war between Germany and America. And as Tim Mason noted, whatever one makes of Hitler's speculations before 1941 about a future war of world domination against the United States, the conquest of living space in European Russia was never conceived of as being a finite goal. And Hitler ruminated repeatedly about the danger of degeneration setting in if the German people should ever find themselves in a situation in which they did not have to struggle against adversaries. And as Mason says, war in the Nazi imagination was waged not merely to defeat Germany's enemies, above all the Jews and those they supposedly controlled. Not, it was not merely to give Germany world supremacy, so that Berlin, renamed Germania, seen here in Albert Speer's megalomaniac architectural plans for remolding the city. Germania, Berlin, would be the capital of the world, the permanent site of the Olympic Games, equipped with an assembly hall with a dome larger than that of St. Peter's, a triumphal arch greater <clears throat> than its counterparts in Paris, um, boulevards, airports, railway stations, motorway hubs, making it the nodal point for communications spanning Europe and the globe. Not only all of this, war was designed to make Germany the dominant nation, the world uh, leading, the world's dominant nation. It's also war waged for its own sake. It's a means of perpetual racial renewal. This grandiose vision was bound to end <clears throat> in failure and destruction. Germany's resources simply didn't allow this to happen. It was a complete fantasy. And as the Allied armies closed in on Germany in the last months of the war, Hitler acknowledged the realities of defeat and began to issue orders for everything to be destroyed in the path of the Allied armies. Now, the saner Nazi officials, led <coughs> by, not by uh, armaments minister Albert Speer, countermanded or frustrated the implementation of this so-called Nero order. But its rationale was clear. The German people, as Hitler confessed on one occasion, had failed to live up to the vision he'd held before them, so they deserved to die. In the Darwinian struggle of race against race, some leading Nazis began to believe the Germans had lost. Stand us up against the wall and shoot us, cried the Labour Front leader Robert Ly when he was handed his indictment for war crimes by the Nuremberg Tribunal. You are the victors. And in a final act of what they took to be heroic self-sacrifice, Hitler, Goebbels, Himmler, eventually Goering, along with many other leading Nazis, committed suicide and the belief that their supreme deed of self-immolation would provide a model for all Germans in ages to come. And before he killed himself, Hitler wrote down his final message to the German people. They were, he said, to resist pitilessly the world poisoner of all peoples, international Jewry. Pitiless war was the future he envisaged for Germany, war that would continue to the end of time. The Nazi vision of war was never shared by the great mass of ordinary Germans. 
They went along with Hitler's revision of the Treaty of Versailles during the 1930s, feeling that he was making Germany great again. But they went along with it, not least because it was achieved with minimal bloodshed. During every crisis in foreign policy, from the remilitarization of the Rhineland through the Anschluss of Austria and the Munich Agreement over Czechoslovakia, agents of the SS Security Service reported what they called a war psychosis among the German people. Reports filtered out to the Social Democratic Party leadership in exile, confirmed in 1938, nowhere is any enthusiasm for war to be found. People know that a war against the greater part of Europe and against America must end in defeat for Germany. And, and when the war was declared, uh, beginning of September 1939, the American reporter, William L. Shira, walking around the streets, the squares in Berlin that had seen the great demonstrations for war in 1914, noted, as he wrote, on the faces of the people, astonishment, depression, no excitement, no hurrahs, no cheering, no throwing of flowers, no war fever, no war hysteria. So the strenuous efforts of the Nazi regime in all its facets to instill in the Germans a will to wage war had failed. In 1940, with the swift victories of the German armies over France, Belgium, Holland, Norway, and Denmark, popular enthusiasm for the regime's foreign policy flared up again. But this again is not least because these victories were achieved with minimal bloodshed. People now expected peace. When the British rejected Hitler's vague and largely rhetorical offer, but much publicized offer of peace, made in a Reichstag speech on the 19th of July 1940, popular outrage was unbounded. The Germans I talked to, Shira wrote, simply cannot understand it. They want peace. Germans realized that a war would bring privations, sacrifice, suffering, and death in the mass of devastation of German cities, the end of Germany as they knew it. And they were right. Out of the ashes of Hitler's Reich, a new Germany would eventually emerge where the fear of war and the desire to avoid it was greater than in any other part of Europe. Thank you very much.
Salute. Intanto grazie soprattutto per una chiarezza di lunghezza espositiva e soprattutto per aver come dire, descritto a fondo dei sentimenti che a me sembrano in un qualche modo una storia e che non siano semplicemente la raffigurazione oleografica di un paese o di come un paese si è vissuto e soprattutto di come un paese si è narrato. Io credo che in questo momento noi dobbiamo fare una pausa e probabilmente anche riflettere su questa lezione di storia. Per cui vi chiedo non di fare domande, ma semplicemente di rifletterci. Noi ringraziamo Ivans, il professor Ivans, di averci dato questa lezione e spero di trovarci qua alla prossima lezione con Enzo Traverso. Grazie a voi. Tra pochi minuti nella sala del minor consiglio avrà inizio E le donne di Anna Bravo e François Debaud. Nella sempre alle 17 nella sala Liguria Spazio Aperto la guerra degli automi tra realtà e fantascienza di, Manzot di Riccardo Manzotti. Alle 18 nella sala del maggior consiglio 1914-1945 l'autodistruzione dell'Europa. Di Enzo Traverso.